very glad you could join us. And I wanna give a shout out and recognize all members of the participating AmCHAMs and business councils from the region. Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Jordan, Lebanon, Kuwait, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. We appreciate the collaboration among AmCHAMs and the value it brings to our members. And we wish an early Eid Mubarak to all our friends who observe the holy month of Ramadan. AmCham has adapted its programming to be online and I'd like to mention a few of our upcoming events. On June 3rd, AmCham is honored to partner with XM, BCIU and the US Commercial Service. XM will provide an overview of its four new time-limited COVID-19 emergency measures to expand the types of financing XM can provide to US companies operating in the Gulf. This will be a very useful event for all uh, that are able to attend. May 31st through June 4th, join us with the US Embassy for a virtual seminar to empower women-led businesses to grow through the US Bahrain Free Trade Agreement. There will be five one-hour sessions over five days covering importing, exporting, franchising, and e-commerce. And on June 9th, we will host a session on partnering to enter the US government construction business, which will offer best practices and lessons learned on how to strategically position yourself to be a successful partner and subcontractor to US companies operating across the Middle East, Europe, and Africa in support of US federal programs. This webinar will be an excellent follow-up to today's session for anyone interested in providing related goods or services to US construction projects. To learn more and to register for these events, you may go to the AmCham Bahrain website. A few quick housekeeping notes. A recorded version of this webinar will be emailed to all registered attendees, as well as posted on AmCham Bahrain's YouTube channel and website. Video and audio have been turned off for attendees but we want to hear from you and invite you to participate by submitting your questions at any time during this session into the chat box on your YouTube live streaming screen or via email to info at amchambahrain.org. Michael will answer your questions after the formal presentation. I am Mary McGinnis, the Executive Director of Amcham Bahrain, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Michael Sedge, who is an American journalist, award-winning author, marketing specialist, and entrepreneur, and president of the Sedge Group, as well as the Michael Bruno Group of Companies, located in the USA, Bahrain, Djibouti, and Italy. They offer architectural design, engineering services, and construction management to the US government. Michael is a former regional president of AmCham Italy, founder of the American Business Council of Djibouti, and a regional director of the Society of American Military Engineers and an active member of AmCham Bahrain. Mr. Sedge is a global expert on working with the US government with 40 years of experience and has lectured on doing business with the American government to groups around the world. I will now hand it over to Michael who joins us from his home near Naples, Italy, where he has been following stay at home orders for nearly two months. Michael. Thank you, Mary. Welcome everyone uh, to this morning's sessions. And I wanna thank all of the AmChams that have participated to make this a reality. And also thank all of you that are uh, home alone, locked up into your house. Uh, as Mary said, I'm sitting in Southern Italy uh, where we've been locked up now for about 79 days. Today we start phase two. So people are eager to get out and get around. Um, I'm a curious type of person. So when I see someone at a presentation, I always ask, well, why should I listen to this person? Why is he or she an expert that will give me input? Uh, so Mary gave a pretty good introduction of who I am and what I've done. 40 years experience with the government, uh, own uh, part owner, half 50% owner of the Michael Bruno Group. And we cover four continents working for the US government. Also, I am the owner of the Sedge Group, which we do marketing, publishing, and now we've gone into television productions as of uh, January of this year. So I, I also, when I'm sitting in a country, I like to uh, you know, pay respect to the country. I've got my, my pin on today, and that's a, that's a pin of the National Italian American Association. So I have my collection as I move through the world in different countries. I like to switch them out 
and give a little respect to the country which I'm in. So the big question today is doing business with the US government. My question is always, first question is, why would you want to do business with the US government? And next slide, please. There's the reason, 1.3 trillion reasons why you, you and your business want to work with the US government. Uh, primarily, if you look at that chart, overseas, which is outside of the continental United States, you're talking about the State Department and international. If you look over to your left, that's $43 billion a year is the average spending for this year for international State Department and international activities. So what does that mean? That means your embassies, your consulates, those type of activities. There's a budget of $43 billion set aside. Over on your right hand side, 50%, 57% of this year's budget goes to defense spending. And a lot of people look at that and think, oh, well, that's for aircraft and that's for um, ships and soldiers. No, that's for overseas military installations. That's for food that has to be purchased and given out to ships. When the ships come into port, they need fuel, they need water, they need support, they need garbage services. The military bases in foreign countries, they need everything. The United States government has to contract for everything they purchase. They cannot just go out and say, we need to buy a package of pencils. They need a contract to do that. Next slide, please. So here are just a few samples of the different government agencies that buy services and goods and support overseas. Uh, you have all your American military services. You have the Department of State. You have MSC. MSC is a subdivision of the United States Navy. They offer ships that go around the world providing support to the United States government. Those ships, if they're pulling into a port in a foreign country, they need to have a contract for that service. If they need barges to bring the ships in, they need to contract those services. They need food, they need to contract food for vegetables, for fresh fruit, for water. Everything that those ships need, they need to contract it with local companies. Uh, you see a MWR, that stands for Morale, Welfare and Recreation. That's a subdivision of the United States Defense Department overseas. So every major military installation overseas has an MWR. What do they do? They run the base restaurant facilities. They run uh, movie facilities. They run sports recreation. And everything that deals with that, whether it be buying supplies, whether it be renovations, all of these things have to be contracted primarily with local companies. Uh, you see a, a logo down there, looks like it has fruit coming out of a shopping cart. That's the DECA, that's a defense uh, commissary agency. They are on every foreign military installation and they are the supermarket for the American military overseas. So if you sell fresh produce, if you sell uh, food products, if you sell anything that you could sell into a local grocery store in your country, that's an opportunity for you. Down lower to the right, you'll see the DODS, that is the Department of Defense European Schools. Now I put the European logo in there, but they also have schools in the Middle East. Those are the schools for the children of the Americans that live in that country. So they would buy furniture. They would, they would have contracts for um, such things as janitorial services. All of those services that you could provide to a school in your country, that's your market for them. The NAX, the Navy Exchange on Navy bases overseas, they buy all types of products. 
including souvenirs from the local country. They have concessionaires. So if you say, well, I don't have something that you could sell for the whole year, but if you have a little stand there, I could set something up for 90 days. So we see, I'll give you an example. We see from the Middle East, we see sales in Italy and Europe for foreign carpets, you know, oriental carpet sales. We see all types of products that are sold at the Navy Exchange. Next slide, please. Excuse me one moment. Okay, so how do you begin working with the United States government? Uh, like all government aid entities and agencies, uh, there's a lot of bureaucratic registrations that you have to go through. The first one is the Data Universal Numbering System or DUNS. DUNS is, um, that's the first thing you need to do. It's a required registration. It's free of charge and it's run by the American group DUNS and Bradstreet. And if you go to that website down below, you click there and there'll be a little link and it will say new registration. So if you have not registered with DUNS, go there, click on it. It will ask you such things as the country you're in, your office address, your registration from your local company uh, for the local countries. All of that information goes into DUNS and it's fairly extensive. But once you finish it and you say, there, I'm ready to go, next slide. Once you get that done, then you're at the CAGE, which is Commercial and Government Entity Registration. That is done simultaneously with DUNS. Uh, so as you're registering for one, you're basically filling in all of the registration for the other. So it used to be a separate system now they're doing it both together just to make sure that every system matches the other. So again, that is done on the Duns and Bradstreet website. It's all free of charge. Go in there and you can take care of that as well. Next slide. So you've got your Duns, you've got your cage, and now it's time to register with the System of Award Management or SAM website. Again, this is all free. It costs you nothing. You must get your DUNS in your cage before you register with SAM. Um, if you do not have those two documents or two numbers, you'll actually get a DUNS number and you'll get a cage number that will be sent to you by email. You have to have those numbers in order to complete your SAM registration. And there's the website down at the bottom of the page Go there, like I said, free of charge, and you can register your company. That particular website will ask you such things as the owners of the company. Any owner that has 50% or more share must be registered on there. Um, it will ask information for your banking information. Now, they're not asking for your details so they can go in there and you know, take your money or anything else. What they want is they want to know what bank you use, what their SWIFT code is, and then what they'll do is once you win a contract with the government, the contracting office goes to the SAM page and they have all of your information. In addition, on the SAM page, the federal government of the United States, all of the purchases and all the contracting that they do is controlled by the Federal Acquisitions Regulations. It's basically the laws that the federal government and local and city governments have to follow for any kind of purchasing. So once you register with the SAM website, it will ask you certain questions, which are basically to fulfill that uh, federal, uh, federal Acquisitions Registration or FAR codes. A good example, uh, if you are a foreign country, foreign being not US, it will ask you for certain qualifications, you know, the nationalities of the owners of your company, this type of thing. That is all to comply with the FAR. In the United States, they also have 
what they call small business set aside companies. So if you're a small American business, there are far regulations that give you an advantage when bidding for contracts. Those are traditionally the advantage for small US business is traditionally not applied or recognized for overseas contracting. Just to make sure that all contractors, no matter where they are in the world, have the same opportunity as everyone else. Next slide. So once you've finished your SAM registration, and this is an example from, from uh, Michael Bruno in Italy, um, what you basically get is this is an overview of what you will see. It'll give you your DUNS number, your CAGE number, whether your company status is active or inactive, your address, and basically this is just the first page, it's about 20 pages, but this gives the general information that a government contracting officer can go in, look at the information and make sure that you're registered, you've been vetted and that you're qualified to get US government contracts. Next page. So during another thing that you're going to need during your SAM registration is you're going to need your North American industry classification system numbers. Basically, what is this? Uh, the NAX is a classification of all types of businesses. So let's just say that you do, um, you, you have equipment, you're, you have cranes and you rent cranes. So you go through this and on this website at the bottom, you put crane service, it will pop up and it will give you a number. And that will be your NAICS code. So if you offer a series of services or goods, you basically go for everything that you can offer, you get that number and you put that into your SAM registration. There are some contract opportunities that will come up and if they, you're, let's just say that you're trying to, to sell um, janitorial services to the local military base or local embassy, but on your registration, you do not have the North American industry classification system code for janitorial services, then they may say that you're not qualified to bid that contract. So it's very important that you put in all of these codes for your whatever services or products you provide. And those will be used when you fill out your SAM registration. So next slide, please. So in general, as I said, the federal acquisitions regulations dictate government buying process and procedures. The American government cannot, this is an example I always like to use, they cannot just walk out, walk down the street and buy a pencil legally. Everything that is purchased, they must have a contract. And in most cases, they must go out on open competition and bid for that contract. So everyone has a fair and equal opportunity to bid to win that contract. So in general, there are five types of contracts that the American government will put out. Uh, the first is a firm fixed price contract. The second one is a cost reimbursement contract. Third is indefinite delivery contracts. The fourth is time and material contracts. And the fifth are labor hour contracts. Next slide, please. So in the firm fixed price contracts, uh, let me just give you an example. The United States government wants to do a construction project at one of their embassies. What they will do is they'll come up with all the specifications. They'll come up with all of the materials they want and the details, and they will advertise a request for proposal. And they will, in that contract, in that request for proposal or RFP, they will say, this is a firm fixed price contract. So what does that mean? You put in your price and let's say you come up and say, my price is $10 million. If you win, that's what the price is going to be. There is, 
there are no negotiations of firm fixed price contracts after the fact. After you get the contract and win the award, they will not negotiate the price. Next slide, please. So on a cost reimbursement contract, let's say, for example, that the government wants uh, a contractor to come in and manage flight operations. They have an overseas military base with an airfield. They need someone to run the operations of the flight control. What they will do is they'll say, okay, here are the qualifications. We need 15 people and here's the basic hours and you calculate it and give me your costs for those people. Then in addition, they may turn around and say, we also want you to provide cleaning and we want you to provide uh, airfield services at the air terminal. So all of the additional items that you have to purchase and you need to perform that contract, those would be the reimbursements. So they're basically giving you a contract to do a service, but say, here's your fixed fee, anything that you have to acquire to do that job, we're going to reimburse you for that. And normally how that works is if you spend 100 for on materials, they will let you allow up to seven, eight percent overhead on those costs. Next slide, please. Uh, indefinite delivery contracts. A lot of times these are used for either construction, for maintenance services, for services and materials that they know they are going to need over the next three to five years, but they don't know exactly what the needs are going to be until they come up. So for example, what they would do is they say, there's, there's one going on right now in Bahrain. I'll use that as an example. They have put out a notice to proceed or not, excuse me, a, a request for proposal for a five year construction contract. And what they will do is they will hire or give contracts to five different companies and any construction services that they need on the US military bases in Bahrain, they will use those five companies for that work. So those five companies will compete on every one of those. So it's an indefinite delivery contract because they don't know if there's going to be two jobs a year or 20 jobs a year. But it's a contract that goes over a, time of, a period of time, could be normally anywhere from three years to five years. And so if you win one of those contracts, you know that you'll be able to compete in a very closed group for the next five years. Next slide, please. Uh, another contract type is time and material. What does that mean? Very similar to the cost reimbursement. The difference is in this particular case, let's say that they need, your, your company does uh, mechanical repairs to aircraft. <clears throat> Excuse me. What they may do is they may say, we need maintenance on our aircraft, but we're not sure exactly how many hours it's going to be every month and we do not know what materials are going to be needed. So what they will do is say, we have a US military uh, 130 aircraft and we need to have work done on the engine. So you've got the contract, your mechanics go out and start working. And then you say, to fix this, we need to buy these parts. So you're getting paid on a per hour basis for your personnel, that's the time, and you're getting reimbursed plus a commission on top of all the materials you buy. So that's an example of a time material contract. Normally those are set up for five year increments as well. So if you win that contract, you usually have them for three to five years. Next slide, please. Uh, the labor hour contracts. Actually my company currently has seven of these contracts uh, in Spain, in Africa and a few other places. What those are 
is they say, we need this person or we need these five individuals. In our case, we have one person that's a construction manager, a couple of people that are uh, engineering technicians. We have environmental technicians. So the government puts out a contract that says, we need these people, we need them to fulfill these many hours every month. So we basically give them a proposal with our hourly rates for those people. If we win the contract, then the, the government gives us a contract fixed price for those hourly rates. And that's basically, they are just paying for labor. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, as I said before, almost all US government contracts are publicly advertised, openly competed under the federal acquisitions regulations. In the United States, once again, they have small business advantage applications or uh, uh, you know, contracts that are set aside for small businesses, but that does not apply in other countries, only if you are a US company going after business in the United States. Traditionally, when the government puts out a request for proposal, they will provide all the instructions of what you need to do to submit that proposal. They will explain what the services or the products are, the specifications for those products. The, they'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. For example, they may say, okay, uh, the, the request for proposal comes out today. Your bid is due in 30 days, but we'll take questions up to 10 days before your delivery date of the proposal. So if you come up with questions, you have that time and they also provide whom you would send the questions to. You have that time to ask questions if you're not clear on what they want, the specifications or anything else. Uh, sometimes, and it's very frequent, uh, someone will ask a question and will say, for example, let's go back to the Bahrain RFP for construction. It says, we will have a site visit so that you can go look at the first job. Well, given the COVID-19 uh, you know, situation that the world is in, given that airlines are not flying, given that certain nationalities cannot leave their country, we asked the question and said, how do you anticipate to have a site visit to look at the project if individuals cannot get to the country? So we're waiting for a reply on that. I spoke with someone this morning. We really expect that they'll come back and say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a virtual site visit and you can ask questions that we will reply to after or during the site visit. Or they will say, that's a good question. We decided to postpone the delivery date of this for another 30 days, allowing everyone to get to Bahrain to do this. So in that case, they would move the deadline and give you more time to prepare your proposal. So the, the, the end note on all requests for proposals from the United States government are they give you the deadlines, they give you the procedures of how to deliver your proposal. For example, they might say, we would like printed proposals, two copies sent to us by courier to this address and this person. Or they may say, no, all, all proposals may be sent uh, digitally to this email address. So all of that information is provided within the RFPs, no matter what the service is. Next slide, please. So the next question is, great, I'm registered. I want to do it. I understand more or less about the contracting. Where do I find opportunities? Uh, there is a global government website, and that is the fbo.gov. And you can go to that, you can register free of charge. And once you register, you can go in and you say, I sell fruits and vegetables. And you type that in 
or you type in the country that you're interested in and all active requests for proposals in that country or for those services will come up and you can start reading through those and applying for those and submitting uh, to all of those. In addition, you know, some embassies and consulates all have their own acquisition system. Good example, country of Bahrain. One of my companies had just won a contract with the US Embassy in Bahrain to do the design and engineering for a renovation project. That was advertised locally. So you also want to look at local advertising. You want to look at, for your local website, look at, you know, if you've got military facilities, look at those. For example, United States Navy for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. That, lo that last website is where they advertise all of their requirements. And I've seen things recently in the last week. They've asked for oil products. They've asked for maintenance of ships. They've asked for maintenance of aircraft. They've asked for food products. They've asked for office supplies. They've asked for construction services. So anything the Navy should have in that area, you can go there. So it, you know, once you get to this point, it takes a little research, some marketing effort, but there are all kinds of areas where each an individual base advertised, but that fbo.gov website is the number one website for the entire world. That's where you should start. Next, uh, next slide. So you're positioned, you're ready to go. And so my, my point is always don't wait until the opportunities come up. Uh, the website I just recommended, that's a good place. The problem is if you're looking at it, there's another 10,000 companies looking at it. And you're all going to have the same amount of time to prepare your, uh, your proposal to win that competition. So what I always try to do is from a marketing point of view, I say, I want to know what opportunities are coming up before they're advertised. And what if we do not have all the qualifications? What if I see something, I say, gee, I want to do that, but I, I only have the qualifications for half of it. And then what happens after we win? And then finally, we'll get to a little guide that I have. So next, way, next slide, please. What I like to try to do is I like to know what's coming in advance. So if I'm working in a country, I try to find the contracting office and the people that can give me information. Give you an example. Uh, the CJTF is Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa. Uh, in the Horn of Africa in Djibouti, there's a command called J44. And what they do is they do minor construction and they do work with USAID. I found out through a friend that they were going to be advertising for engineer services. So I did not have, and my friend told me what contract they are going to use. I do not have that contract. So I did some research, found out what the contracting officer's name was, contacted him and said, I think that we're qualified to fill those jobs that are going to be advertised, but I don't have the contract. Do you know the companies that have it? He sent me a list of the companies that already had a contract. It was one of those five-year IBIQ contracts. I selected one. I contacted them and said, there's going to be a bid coming out under your contract for four people in Djibouti. We're qualified. We are there. We can fulfill that. So we partnered with them and we won the contract for a five-year period. Uh, another contract, this is the, similar to the one I'm talking about in Bahrain. We did not have the qualifications to bid a construction contract. We are not a construction company, but we do all the engineering and the design work for the construction contract. So we reached out to companies that we thought would bid that and we partnered with them. And then when they won, we became their design partner for the next five years. Uh, other examples. Uh, no, go back one, please. Okay, down below, the Navy Exchange. Uh, as I said, they're managed out of Naples, Italy. So if I were in a position to provide services in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, 
uh, for the Navy Exchange to sell, then what I would do is do my research, find out the management of the Navy Exchange in Naples and start communicating with them to find out what they need and how I could fulfill their needs in my country. Similarly, um, if you're in de construction, design business, engineering business, all of those, there's annual events that all of these organizations have that support the US government. We're a member of the Society of American Military Engineers. And every year they have a joint engineering conference with about 5,000 companies that are supporting the US government. And also the military are there. So we go there every year, we meet with companies that we can partner with. And we also meet with the clients and ask them, what do you have in my country? What's coming up as far as opportunities? That gives us an advantage that we know before everybody else or most of the people before it's even advertised and we can start positioning our company to win that contract. Next slide, thank you. Next slide. Okay, so positioning, oh, back there we go. Positioning and marketing is all part of a winning strategy. Um, again, contracts are not negotiated after the competition. If you win the contract, whatever you submitted as far as your pricing, that is what you are going to get. I see many companies that win a contract, they sit down and say, okay, let's negotiate. They don't negotiate. If you, if you do not agree with the pricing you submitted, they will just cancel you as the number one bidder and go to the number two bidder. Um, they will have, they may have, all contracts have a contracting officer. That is not, once the, once the contract is awarded, you will work with a contract officer's representative. That's normally a person wherever you are located that has been delegated by the contracting officer to work with you on fulfilling your contract. Um, payment systems, this is another reason why you should want to work for the United States government. On average, it takes 14 to 21 days from the time you submit your, your invoice and your whatever support documents they request for you to get paid. Um, they have a online, what's called the Wide Area Workforce System or WAWF, and Basically, you submit it. From there, it automatically starts a clock and it goes to the contract officer's representative. That person approves it within three days. It goes to the contract officer. That person will approve it within three days. It goes to the US Finance Department. They will approve it within three days. And then traditionally, three to five days later, you have your money in the bank. Next contract, please, or next slide. <laughs> So this is the guide that I always recommend uh, only because I know the author. He is one of the top uh, lawyers for government contracting in the United States, uh, Mark Lemire, a good friend of mine. And I was supposed to write the book with him, but then halfway through, I said, I don't have time to write the book, you finish it. Uh, but if you're ever looking for consulting in the United States, uh, he's one I would recommend. On the first page, I gave you my email address. Uh, so feel free that if you have any questions about this or other things, go ahead and email me, don't, don't hesitate. And last slide. Here we are with questions. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for that uh, very useful presentation. We, um, I have a couple of questions, but let me start with one that uh, came across from the audience. Uh, I'm a UAE registered company. Can I still do business with the US government? And what type of business activity would I be able to do? You certainly can. I know several UAE companies that are working constantly with the United States government. And, and I'll turn the question around. It's not really what kind of business you can do, it's what business do you do? Yeah, uh, there's all kinds, you know, everything, as I said, everything from supply, office supplies to 
janitorial services to garbage pickup to providing furniture, providing office equipment, uh, you know, everything is available. Uh, you know, just imagine, let's just take the US embassy. Imagine what it takes to run that embassy between uh, if, if they've got gardening, they need, they have a contract for gardening services. If they need security guards, they have contracts for security guards. If they need uh, printer ink cartridges, they have a contract for printer ink cartridges. So you, the way you want to start is to say, what does my company do? What do I provide? Do I provide staffing? Do I provide services? Do I provide maintenance? Do I provide you know, materials, equipment? And once you get going on there, then start looking from a local point of view into what, what city you're in and what opportunities are there and then start expanding outwards. So Michael, you talked about how people can go to FBO or SAM.gov to find out about what uh, contracts are being bid. How can people do market research ahead of that kind of procurement research? What um, the government buys, um, maybe in different parts of the world, in different sectors. So uh, a company such as this one in UAE can find out, does the government need what they provide? Uh, everything else, market research is the key. So that's why I said, start with your local country. You might reach out to the business sector of your local embassy or consulate. If there are military installations, U.S. military installations in your country, you might reach out to the contracting office of that military base. And you'd be surprised if you research enough, all this information is available online. You know, you can sit at home or you can sit in your office or have someone in your marketing department, depending on how large you are, research, research, research. Also, do research for conventions that are being set up for your sector of business. And there are thousands and thousands. You know, I used to think I'm gonna to go to all these conventions and then I finally said, no, I'm gonna cut it down and do three a year because there's just too many. Uh, you know, telecommunications. Uh, there's one major convention for telecommunications for the US government. Because if you do telecommunications, they have contracts for telecommunications services. They have contracts for cellular phone services. They have contracts for internet services. They have contracts for electrical, for water. Anything that you need to run an operation, they need contracts. And those are all contracts that are rebid every so many years. So you may not have it now, but start researching, find out who won it, how they won it, you know, get the information and then look and say two years from now, we're gonna bid that. Um, so here's another question from our audience. Do U.S. contractors contact Amcham Bahrain or identification uh, for identification of local subcontractors? Are there any advantages for a U.S. vet African-American women 100% owned company in the GCC? I think this leads into um, the idea of set-asides and uh, you know, does the US government recognize uh, minority owned businesses and such for uh, foreign owned companies? So it, 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 it sounds as if the may, maybe, maybe those are two different questions and two different answers. <laughs> it, it sounds as if the company is a US registered company, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, probably in Africa, but looking at GCC. <laughs> Those are two different questions. I see. Okay. okay, yes. So the first thing, <laughs> if you are a U.S. company, traditionally, unless you are bidding a global contract or a large regional contract that is issued in the United States, no small business set aside will be applied. Good example. My group of companies, the, the mother company is Michael Bruno LLC in Delaware. We are a veteran-owned small business. We have never won any work being a veteran owned small business because all of our work is done overseas in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. So the answer is if you bid in the United States, 
And normally international contracts as the type we're talking are not bid in the United States. They are bid, their contracting officers may be in, our contract office may be in Italy, it may be in Germany, it may be in the Middle East at a local level at the local embassy or military base. So my answer is there are opportunities, but in my experience, you will not get credit for small business, woman-owned business, or veteran-owned business. So that, that second part, uh, your best chance, if you are a small business, what I would suggest is to find the large American companies that are working in that sector, partner with them for whatever part of the contract you can do. We're on a couple of global contracts. We cannot do work in the Pacific. We do not do work in the United States, but we can cover Europe, Africa, and Middle East. So when we partner, we say, we are your partners in these regions, and we offer you presence, local presence in these regions, because that adds a added value to that team. Company go about finding a prime contractor to offer their services as a subcontractor. One of the things that they have on the FedBiz Ops is you can go in and you can say, I want to see already awarded contracts in this sector. So let's say, for example, you do environmental services but you only do it for Northern Africa. Then you go in and you look for the global contracts that have been awarded and it will give you the list. It normally lists a name, an address and an email and the name of the person for the awards. So if they gave contracts to five different com companies, you could basically contact all five of them with this information, send them your qualifications and say, I would like to support you in this region. That's one way. The other way is to look and come up with these conventions that they hold. And as a small business, go to the convention, but take your business cards, take your brochures, don't pay for a stand. You, what your goal is, you just want to go around and introduce yourself to all of the main exhibitors, give them your information and say, and I'm in this region and I would love to support you guys. Um, can you just uh, speak for a moment about the GSA, the General Service Administration, Federal Supply, and the Federal Procurement Data System as resources? Yes. There's basically one of the contracts that the U.S. government has set up, and this is primarily because they got tired of issuing thousands and thousands of little requests for proposals for office supplies and this type of thing that is constantly being used. So they have the GSA system. What the GSA system is, and the United States Navy has another one called Seaport uh, Next Generation, but they're very similar. They're a blanket contract. So if you offer office furniture, for example, uh, you could take, and there, these contracts are always in a rotating or revolving open system. So you can go online to the GSA system or to the Navy Seaport E and say, I want to apply to provide office furniture to the entire US government around the world. You fill out all the forms, you do all the documents, you do everything, you submit it. And if you win, and when I, for example, I think in Seaport E, there's something like 190,000 contractors. So it, they just keep adding to it. But if you win that, it's there are traditionally a 10 year contract and it will list what products you have. There's some pricing involved. Uh, it's very extensive to propose it and to put the package together. Uh, you're mute. <laughs> okay, I, I see you moving your lips, but we couldn't hear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so basically what I was saying is normally there's two volumes of work, but it's well worth it if you get the contract, because then you can go to any U.S. government entity around the world and you can offer them the services through that contract. 
Thanks. Um, uh, I have to get used to being on video. Um, so could you provide us with an overview of the future trends for US government humanitarian contract opportunities in the MENA region, if you um, happen to know of that? Uh, it's a good question. And it's a question that very few people today <laughs> can really answer, uh, only because of the federal government situation and, and who's in charge. But let's just say that moving forward, if we go to, if we follow the trend, if you take the last 15 years, uh, there is a fairly extensive and large budget for support in whether it be USAID or through, through other uh, examples. Uh, I just saw maybe three months ago, there was a major uh, opportunity in Africa, but it was paid for by Department of Energy. So there will be opportunities in that region. And I think there'll be more and more based on information I am hearing, but there'll be primarily smaller projects. In other words, you're going to get funding to do a project for $250,000. And then there'll be another one for a half a million dollars. Then there'll be another one for $25,000. So overall, as far as uh, like USAID type projects and these type of local funding projects, they're not going to be in the fives and tens of millions of dollars, but there's going to be a lot of them. and hurdles companies face when trying to complete the registration process and when bidding on contracts? And what is your advice to them? Uh, good question. I'll tell you why. Because my running through all of these different steps, it looks easy and everyone says, oh, well, that's no problem. I'll go here, here, and here, and I'm registered. It's fairly extensive. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, you click this button and 10 questions come up because you click one button. And if you have problems registering, this is common. To, I mean, to American companies, they have problems. There are several companies in the United States that will do that for you. They, they have been set up to register companies. So if anyone is having problems registering on any of those platforms that I've mentioned, send me an email. I'll be happy to give you recommendations of three or four companies that provide that service. And you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. I hired one of these companies last week because we changed our address and we put it into one of the platforms, but it didn't match the other platform. And so automatically it, it threw it up and said, oh, it's not valid. And if you're not valid, every year you have to renew your SAM registration. And if all the platforms don't match each other perfectly, an error will come up and they're not gonna sit and spend their time telling you what the problem is. It's up to you to discover it. So if you have problems, send me an email. I'll be happy to give you some suggestions on who to contact. Well, thank you very much, Michael. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. And we really appreciate um, everyone joining us today, especially our AmCham members from the Gulf and MENA region. And we will be sending this um, recording, uh, which will have your uh, email attached to it to all people who, um, uh, joined us and registered today. So uh, I want to just remind people for anyone who's interested in any of our upcoming events to go to our website and learn more. And we wish everyone good health and good business. Thanks. Thank you.